I'm going to follow up on this presentation. And this presentation is going to be more about the future, what is strong AI, and what are the huge difficulties and struggles that we have to get through before we manage to do anything that's close to that. Um, again, it's a 15-minute presentation. So in a 15-minute presentation, don't expect to go deeply. There are lots of even philosophical concepts that you should be raising in order to get to this point. We're going to pass them very quickly, and we're just going to expand later on during private discussion if you want to. But we're going to see that there are also technological challenges, and those are the technological challenges that need to be solved in order for us to approach what we consider strong AI. This is the most optimistic estimation of where can we reach strong AI. Um, those are estimations that are coming from here, from Ray Kurzweil. He's a futurist at Google, well, he used to be a futurist at Google. His prediction in the past have been proven mostly true. Um, why? Because it takes into account the first derivative of the technology, uh, technological growth, which is the acceleration. And it's easier to build technology on top of technology if you don't reinvent the wheel every single time. So that's why 2030, 2040 is not necessarily that far-fetched. Now you could say, as we will see, that there are some issues that prevent us from going that fast and that we might not be able to solve them, simply because we have no clue exactly where we're going. It's pretty much advanced research, so it's very hard to estimate. <laughs> First, back to the question, what is intelligence? Because when we say strong AI, we talk about intelligence, artificial intelligence. So what is that? <laughs> so if we look at the definition of intelligence, it's the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. So as it was said, we're pretty much already there. That's why we can say we have weak AI. And why, that's why we can speak about AI. Not every system, not every machine learning system is AI, but we can build, using machine learning tools, actual weak AI. Now the real question is, what is consciousness? We want to know, we want to have systems that behave and act like humans, because to the extent of our knowledge, that is strong AI. We want to build a machine to our image. We want a machine that is able to adapt to feel, to express itself, to self-identify, it can do all, all this kind of thing, and that can basically learn to tackle any problem. So the first step towards that is general game playing. There are some laboratories in the world that are working on that. So the DeepMind Lab, for example, or OpenAI Initiative, are trying to solve general game playing. You can basically, you have a framework in which you can start training your AI to play video games. And those are not Pac-Man or chess or stuff like that. Those are proper video games that you guys were playing five years ago, maybe. So if you can have a system that is able to play all those different games efficiently and effectively with different set of parameters and rules and to adapt to the different games, you start to have what we call a general game playing AI. And this is the first stage towards true AI. You have something that does not need to know about a specific problem. You have something that needs to know the rules of the problem. Now, this is the best game playing machine we have. It's uh, basically a scan of the con major connectivity of the brain. And there is a, an approach right now in research, and especially in advanced AI research, which is neuroscience is telling computer science how to build AI, but AI research in computer science is also teaching us a lot about our brain, because the fact is, we don't know much about the brain and how it's working. So it's very hard for us to define what is strong AI and what is consciousness and those kind of concepts, when we cannot def clearly and definitely define it even for ourselves. But now, back to a more rational idea. This is the average amount of connection in your brain. 8.6 quadrillion collection. To give you an idea, if you were counting to one quadrillion with at the rhythm of one per second, like one, two, three, it would take you 32 million years to get to one quadrillion. That's the size, that's the scale. It's a massive scale. We are nowhere technologically to anything that can get close to that scale. Why? 
is because of a final factor. One neuron is connected between 40,000 to 150,000 other neurons. In a CPU, one of the latest, not necessarily this year, but like two years ago, you have billions of transistors. Those transistors are connected with a final factor of four to six on average. That's a completely different scale. And that's the best we can do currently with our technology. So what can we conclude? Is that our intelligence, it's not really about how fast you can process things. It's not about how quickly you can think. Intelligence is how do you get access to the information? How does it spread through your system? And that's the problem right now, is that we don't have a good interconnectivity. We don't spread information efficiently. Why is it a problem? Well, because as always in analytics, as it was said, the problem is, first of all, the data quality. If you have bad data, forget it. You, may, you might have the best model in the world if you have bad data. It's garbage in, garbage, garbage out. And the second thing is the size of the search space. When you start having such huge amount of fan out or complexity, even with neural network, current, current neural networks, it's already an issue, you increase the size of the search space to such an extent that you have a combinatorics explosion. And that we cannot solve it right now. With our current technologies, we cannot solve it. So you cannot have a presentation without an XKCD comics. But <laughs> that's, basically, that's basically it. It's, like, it's very easy to do the first stage, to create advanced neural networks, even to play Go chess, which has already have a, a massive amount of combinatorics. But if you want to go into general game playing, if you want to go into something that can solve problems the way we do, or actual things the way we do, that's, that's massively complex. And the problem at the end, for people who know about mathematics, it's a very simple problem, is, is polynomial equal to non-polynomial problem? The P versus NP problem. This is, this is a massive <coughs> computer science problem. It's basically, let me give you a very simple example. You have a stack of a million rock. And in this million rock, you want to create two pile of rock of exactly the same weight. And the, all of those rocks what got a random weight. You need to try all the combination. It's very complicated. If you want to explore the full space, you need to try all of them. No, if I give you two piles of rocks and I tell you, are those the same weight? It's very easy for you to see it. You just add each pile and you have the result and you can tell if it's the same weight. It's the same. Finding the right combination to get the same weight for the two piles is a non-polynomial problem. Checking if they're both the same weight is a polynomial problem. And that's actually the big problem in artificial intelligence, is that we're trying to solve this effectively. So what are the current solutions? High performance computing. We throw more CPU at the problem, which we can do because no technology is cheap. But there is so much we can do. Right now, the state of the art uh, silicon technology is about a few nanos. I remember it's about six or seven nanos. I don't remember exactly the number. It's quite, it's quite small. It's atomic scale. And at this, sta at this stage, if you try to reduce the size of the chip anymore, you, have, you start to have some very weird problem because you go into quantum, quantum physics field. So you have to have, you know, you have to, you start to have quantum tunneling between your different logic gates, which means you start to have randomness in the behavior of your system, which in your current uh, Boolean logic system, binary logic system, means it doesn't work anymore. So right now, the evolution of CPUs is no longer increasing the speed or the power of the CPU. It's actually reducing the amount of energy required to make it run. It's what power per watt. That's the evolution of CPUs. So it, this is not going to solve our problem. <coughs> Second solution is approximation. You don't want to have the exact answer. You want to have a good enough answer. And that's a good, good solution, because that's how we work. Our brain works like that. You never have an absolute answer to your question. You have a certain amount of certainty. For example, um, latest discovery and what we call AI would be AlphaGo. AlphaGo is a mix of those two. It's high performance computing mixed with good approximation. This is basically the system that they use, which is, up, those are all fuzzy logic based system. Those are, they are not, they're not meant to find the right answer. They're meant to 
find the probable right answer at any time. And this is basically what they were running it on. <laughs> this is massive. It's a massive cluster. No question. Was Go expertise, expertise really required for this problem? So Go is a very complex game because of the combinatorics, but the rules are fairly simple. And because of that, it's more about the analytic expertise that was required rather than actually knowledge of the Go game. And because of that, that's where we start to speak about AI, weak AI as it stands, and we go towards the general game playing AI. Now solution number three, and those are potential ways to explore, and we are in the field of advanced research of what's going on right now, so there is no definite answer to all of this. Do any of you know what this is? No? This is a biological computer. I was going to say, is it a neuron? Yeah, it really looks like that. It's a slime mold. Ah. So it's, it's something that scientists have been looking at. It's very interesting. It's basically a biological computer. And what it's doing right now, it's solving a traveling salesman problem in polynomial time. It's basically, this is a, this is a Tokyo underground map. And it's actually solved the most efficient way to do the Tokyo underground map in 16 hours. Whereas it took us, as human beings, about 100 years. So this is one of the research going on. Another way, this is a quantum computer chip. So quantum computers, they work in the world of fuzzy, fuzzy logic. They can explore the whole search space simultaneously. So you don't have this problem about having a massive scale search space anymore. This is one way we can solve potentially this problem. And finally, this is an optical computer. This is a photonic computer. Photonic computer, computer allow potentially for massive parallelization of problems and remove the input-output um, uh, uh, issues that you have normally when you start to deal with massive amount of data. Those are technologies that are currently working and we are using them. They are not to scale, they are not efficient enough right now to solve those problems, but they show the way where we could potentially go in the next few 10, 20, 30, 40 years to start going towards true AI. So those are the take out. Currently, analytics need to be a combination of known techniques. And as John said, we need to find a way to have a system that do analytics on top of analytics, that finds the right model for your problem automatically. That's the current stage. If we want to go to our true AI, we need technological breakthrough because our current technology cannot do that. It requires infinite amount of computing power for what we have right now, which is impossible to get. Finally, analytics is a field that is evolving very quickly. It's all techniques. Everything is all techniques. But the way we are using them now, the fact that we have so much data nowadays and so on, make it a very fast evolving field. And you don't need to catch up, you don't have to, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can build on a lot of technology that is already out there to innovate on top of those. And that's the only way you can keep up in technology. And finally, conclusion, data always trump analytics. There is no, no way around that. No matter how good is your analytics, if you don't have the data to teach it, it will not work. What is better, to have an accurate map or an inaccurate map or no map? That's the question at the end. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>